Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this scene behind me is uh, not where I'm lecturing from, obviously. Uh, this is a place up in Alaska that I've been going to for about 20, 25 years with a group of other docks where we just go out, fish, look at the wildlife, sea whales, over, uh, otters, and eagles. It sort of takes the pressure off of just everyday living. Well, with today's seminar, I want to present some facts and ideas that we can use to increase predictability for placing pterygoid implants. As Julia said, I'm an oral maxillofacial surgeon. I did graduate dental school many, many years ago and found out that my niche in practice was in oral surgery and continued with that for up until now where I'm still practicing. A lot of teaching, a lot of good friends around the world, and it's been an enjoyable you know, practice for me and a time of life. <clears throat> so before we get started, uh, I wanna address some questions that I received mostly via email about uh, last week's Zygoma presentation. And then we'll delve into what we're talking about today with the Zygoma. The total amount of the lecture time should be about maybe 45, 50 minutes. So the first question was where to place the zygoma retractor? This is very important. The retractor is placed at the juncture of the lateral orbital rim and the zygomatic arch. Now you can find this by placing a finger at the notch and feel the space. You need to dissect. Now let me shut the phone off. You need to dissect up along the malar buttress into this space. And that's where you're going to place the retractor. This is very important. Injury to the muscle will cause bleeding and sometimes profuse bleeding. You can uh, use, if you want to dissect behind the malar buttress for a little bit, you can use a wet gauze behind the malar buttress to elevate, elevate the muscle. Now, because the gauze is going to saturate with blood, you really have to make sure that you remove that gauze before closing. In instances where there has been profuse bleeding, this is usually treated with pressure. Although what I have done is added avatine, it's microfibular collagen into the space and with pressure. But it's a, it's a warning, be very careful and do not traumatize that muscle. And quite frankly, we don't need to be there in the dissection. Why place the inferior implant first? Well, I place the inferior implant, making sure that there is about 10 millimeters of bone between the two implants. If we place the superior implant first, there may not be enough bone in, in my hands to place the second implant. Also, I want to keep as much distance as possible from the orbit when placing the second implant. So almost, in fact, all of the articles, all of the cases that I've done, I've started with placing the inferior implant first. How to measure the amount of bone above the implant. So what you wanna do is place the osteotomy drill into the pilot hole, position the measuring guide at the height of contour of the zygoma. Make sure that the guide and the drill are parallel and the distance between these two parallel objects is the amount of bone that you have. Obviously, if you're making your pilot hole close to the rim, you're more apt to have fracture and you're not gonna get retention of the implant. Is the path of the superior implant always in the sinus? Well, when planning for a quad zygoma, the path of the second implant is almost always within the sinus. Uh, the exception to this may be, as I've had a couple cases, where the lateral border of the maxilla is so concave that both, both implants are outside the uh, sinus. But most often, that second implant is going to be within the sinus before it reaches the zygoma. There was a lot of information and a lot of questions about more information about the Zygo Guide. The Zygo Guide is the principle is really taking from geometry. The guide is attached to the handpiece 
and then it is parallel to the drill. Very simple concept. What's important is to align the guide over the path of the drill. The position of the guide on the cheek shows the direction of the drill. You are safe if the guide is not pointing into the orbit. If you need inf additional information or something, then you can uh, go to zagoguide.com. You know, Let me show you a quick uh, animated video of the guide, which may make these concepts a little bit more uh, real. So obviously we want to avoid any of the drilling into the orbit. And through this simple concept with the guide and the drill, we can make sure that they're parallel. You want to make sure that the guide, as you're looking at it, is directly over the drill. And what I like about this, we're using the guide, is that I can also use this on a straight handpiece, which is very acceptable when you're making your pilot holes. So if you position the guide directly over the drill, you'll be able to see the path of the drill in relation to the orbit. So without, with that out of the way, uh, let's talk about the topics we're gonna to cover today in these next 40, 45 minutes that we have together. So I do wanna go over some surgical anatomy of the pterichoid implant. We'll make this a rather routine procedure. Again, we're gonna talk about point lines and angles as we did with the zygoma. I'll show some implant surgery as it's combined with doing zygomas. And we'll give a brief description of nasalis implants. And I wanna share with you a few cases that were problematic but show how with good planning, we can do a, a, a very successful procedure. So let's examine the surgical anatomy for placing pterygoid implants. The pterygoid maxillary implant originate in the maxilla in the first or second molar position. And it anchors into the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. Now this bone quality in the area is mostly type three and type four bone. So the admonition would be is that this is not a standalone implant. It has to be combined with conventional implants or in severe atrophy with the zygoma. The pterygopalatine fissure is the space behind the maxillary tuberosity and the palatine bone. Now there are three bones that are involved when placing the pterygoid implant. There is the maxilla. Here we have the fissure. We have the palatine bone and the sphenoid. And the sphenoid is where we get the medial and lateral plates of the pterygoid process. So here is our palatine bone. You see this is the tuberosity and this is the fissure. And you see how that 
palatine bone wraps around the sphenoid. Notice that that fissure is just posterior to the tuberosity, and that's going to be an ideal point from which you want to measure. So these three images show the location of the medial and lateral plates of the sphenoid. When placing pterygoid implants, it is the medial wall that acts as an anchor. But again, this is type three, a very, this bone could be very cortical, but there's very little bit of uh, cancellous bone. So the anchorage is here, but it's going to begin in the first or second molar of the edentulous arch. So let's discuss again what we talked about last week with uh, zygoma implants. And we go back now to Euclid of Alexandria as the father of geometry, because basically it's all based on geometry where we're going to be placing it, and that is points, lines, and angles. So how do we convert this concept to help us placing pterygoid implants? One landmark for placing the pterygoid implant is the hamulus. If you put your finger in the, in the mouth, in the posterior maxilla, you can palpate this notch, the pterygoid you know, hamulus. The pterygoid hamulus is this hook-like process at the lower extremity of the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. The tendon uh, of the tensor valley, uh, valley palatini glides around this hamulus, and it is the origin of the pterygomandibular raphe. So in the mouth, you can place your finger and glide your finger upwards along the pterygomaxillary raphe, and you'll come to the hamulus. Landmarks define the path for placing the pterygoid implant, much as what we saw last week in the zygoma implant. The implant is gonna be coming from the region of the first or second molar, about 10 millimeters behind, you know, or 10 millimeters anterior to the tuberosity. You're going to be directing it towards the hamulus at an angle of approximately 30 degrees, taken from the plane of the alveolus and directed to the medial pterygoid plate. So this is just views from a different perspective of the point lines and angles. Begin by recognizing the occlusal plane of the alveolus in either site. The entry point of the implant is typically about 10 millimeters from the tuberosity or from that fissure anterior to about the first or second molar region. And the implant then is gonna pass through this pterygomaxillary fissure to end up in the medial plate of the pterygoid, of the sphenoid. Now, starting the drill point, your access point for your implant, what I do is, well, take the ridge and divide it into thirds, and I want the point of the drill, the uh, implant site, to be on the lateral third of the alveolus. So this view summarizes the considerations for placing the pterygoid implant. The entral point is one third, at one third of the ridge on the buccal side, about 10 millimeters anterior from the pterygomaxillary fissure. You're gonna palpate the hamulus and you'll direct the osteotome that you'll use first before the drill towards the hamulus at about a 30 degree angle from that occlusal plane. So the arrow shows the path of insertion to the medial pterygoid plate back here at the second molar region all the way to the medial pterygoid plate.
So we'll look at this a little bit on how we teach this on our courses with our hands-on uh, workshops, whether they're cadaver course or for our live surgical course that we do down in Brazil on these take-home models. So I'll show you how we try to describe this to the docs who are taking the classes. So what's important is to use this osteotome. Right now, the osteotome is just pointing at the hamulus. And you want to begin the point where you would like the head of the implant you know, to be. Usually, it's about 10 millimeters anterior to that pterygomaxillary fissure, or the maxillary palatine fissure, excuse me. Place the osteotome through the thin cortical bone and soft cantilus bone directed towards the hamulus. You'll feel this very, very soft bone. And then when you get to a little bit more resistance, that's going to be your, your signal that you've passed through the fissure and you're approximating the medial plate. Now, what's good is that you should take out the osteotome and then almost immediately what we like to use is the uh, pterygoid, the uh, drill, pilot hole, and then do sequential drilling to place the implant. But quite frankly, this bone is so soft that you want to under drill the site and then place your implant. Now that drill is going to go all the way down through with the pilot drill and with the secondary drill to the medial plate. Typically these implants are anywhere from 18 to 20, 22 millimeters in length. And thank goodness for Norris because we have uh, multi-unit abutments up to 60, 70 degrees, which would enable us to bring that implant site parallel to the other implants that we're placing. So now that we get the uh, concept with the plates out of the way, let me run through a couple cases that we have had uh, before the lecture is finished. So this is a case that was referred to us by a general dentist and what this doc did when he was placing implants. You can see this was a, a dentulous ridge. He had a couple, one implant that was failing. But what he managed to do was to place two implants and dislodge them into the sinus. And having done that, and he practiced, so when he placed the implants on the left side, he also put the implants into the sinus. So the patient comes to us with the requisition of the, what he, she wants is a fixed appliance. So how are we going to do this? And this is an excellent case using the zygoma and the pterygoid implants with conventional implants. So here you see the implants on both sides that are up into the antrum. Crestal uh, midline incision, as we talked about last week, crestal, and then vertical relaxing incisions, you know, posteriorly. So elevating, you see the malar buttress, and we're opening up into the sinus and we see the implants that are now dislodged into the antrum. So the first thing to do is to take out the implants. There is a lot of granulation tissue, inflam inflammatory tissue here, so we're going to enucleate those tissues, debride the area, clean it as much as possible, and then copious irrigation. This anterior failing implant, you know, was also removed. Look at that large defect that we see here in the antrum. This would be an impossible case to treat for a fixed appliance for using conventional implants and bone grafting surgery. So we see the area of the defect, but we're able to find some solid bone on the lateral portion of that malar buttress up here in the zygoma. So we're going to completely bypass the inflamed sinus and this, all this area which is now just residual bone, I mean just residual tissue that we have to enucleate. And again, what we have here is sequential drilling. 
but also note that there is defect of bone in the area of the lateral maxillary wall. We're not completely concerned about this because the anchorage for the zygoma implant is going to be in the zygoma. That's where we have the osseointegration. And these implants still, in this situation, will torque down to 60, 70 newton centimeters. Uh, just a mucus seal that we had to clean out. Sequential drilling. And then we're putting in, I'm putting in the measuring guide that will tell us the length of the implant that we're going to place. So here is our Norris implant put in with the, uh, with the driver. And positioning the implant on the crest of the ridge. There is some bone on the alveolar portion. There is no bone over here at the lateral wall of the maxilla. If you want to bone graft this area, uh, it's unnecessary because that graft, even if it does heal, is not going to do anything to support the Norris implant, the zygoma implant. All of the support in the anchorage is up in the zygoma. That's what we have to get to. Now, anterior implant is also placed. These are Norris tough implants. And what I did on the other side is we have patches over the orbit. So I'm just outlining the orbit and I want to draw a line from around the orbit into the oral cavity. Give me some sort of a reference line because there's so much destruction of the lateral wall of the maxilla due to the reaction of the implants that have been put into the antrum. So the implants are going to be removed and all that granulation tissue is going to be enucleated. And this is just one large defect. I suppose if you wanted to place a membrane over this, uh, like a collagen membrane or biotechnique membrane, that might be acceptable. It being, may be a benefit, but we did not. So sequential drilling, here's the pilot hole that's going in, but take note of this very thin bone between the defect and where the drill is. But we needed this spot in order to get into the zygoma for retention. Then the Norris drill is placed into that pilot hole directed to about the uh, distal of the second bicuspid region to prepare a path. I want to clean out the sinus. This bone is going to be lost. Uh, there is just, is very thin. There's almost nothing here to support a very poor blood supply. And in fact, when you do this sequential drilling to place the implant, that takes away the bone. Not really concerned. I'm shy about the situation that was given to us, but we're going to place the implant now on the lateral aspect, bypassing the sinus into the zygoma. The implant with its smooth surface is fine. If you wanted to, I suppose you can cover that with a collagen membrane or a buccal fat pad or CGF membrane if you wanted, or bioexclude membrane. All of that may help just in the closure, does not do anything to support the uh, retention of the implant. Anterior implant placed on this side. So we have the zygoma and some anterior implants. So after surgery, we see now we have the pterygoid implant, the zygoma, and we're able to place anterior implants. On the contralateral side, again, the pterygoid, here is a pterygoid, and here we are with the zygoma implant. The full scan postoperatively shows the positions of our implants. And this is going to be, an, it turns out to be an excellent case because look at the support that we have for a fixed procedure. So the patient, this patient comes in the morning, we do the surgical procedure, followed while the patient's waiting, followed by the prosthetic procedure. 
which has already been planned. The patient can leave with a PMMA uh, appliance. This is after healing with the final appliance. Support system with six implants and a fixed prosthesis. So with the using the zygoma and the pterygoid implants, we were able to salvage this case, which otherwise would have been a complete disaster. Nasalis implants can also be used in conjunction with uh, conventional implants or zygoma implants because in severe atrophy of the maxilla, although there is no bone available for placing implants on the ridge, you can start the implant more on the palate, but then you have to look for an area where you're going to be getting anchorage. Now the nasalis implants are used when there's so much deficient bone here. There are few vascular considerations because everything is going to be reflected with the mucoperiosteal flap with one exception, and that's Kieselbach's plexus, way back here, posterior to the anterior nasal spine. Now, Kieselbach's plexus, responsible for nosebleeds and, and allergies and when there's just trauma to the region, it's a plexus because it is formed by the septal branch of the sphenopalatine artery, the septal branch of the greater palatine artery, the anterior ethmoid that's coming down and the septal branch of the superior labial artery. So there is quite a plexus of veins, of uh, vessels in that region. So if you're going to be doing this procedure with a nasalis type implant, your choice, you can come from the central area and tap into the uh, lateral plate, the, the um, piriform aperture of the nose. You can come from this region, you can see on this slide, going into the piriform aperture. But the implant is gonna start more on the palate, obviously, because in the cases that we're going to be using this, the alveolar bone will be extremely thin. If you wanna come from, say, the canine region, we can go also either up to the, up to the uh, piriform aperture, or most often we go back into the vomer. This is nice solid bone. Just be careful that this is gonna be anterior, so we're not going to involve the, uh, uh, the Kieselbach plexus. So when the model surgery, we can show exactly where that implant is going to be placed. First, we drill this with a, we place an osteotome and then under drill the site for the implant so that we get some bone compaction of that in the uh, cancellous bone. So here's an interesting case it came to us. A patient comes to us from Arizona. Uh, she's 76 years old. She has a uh, very active life life uh, style. She rides a motorcycle um, on weekends. She has a full upper denture that's been there for years, uh, but there's always been problems with eating. We see, as you will see, there's a very small maxilla. And when we took the CT scans, we see chronic sinusitis on the left side, and she's wearing a lower partial denture, and what she wants is a fixed case. Uh, so I have not seen very many 76-year-old ladies with uh, a pin or a tag you know, in the tongue. And here's our alveolar ridge. It's very deceptive because it really looks, looks like we have lots of alveolar bone. But as you know, in the maxilla, the soft tissue very often hides the very thin ridge that we have on the alveolus. And now you can look at and see how, even with the denture, this is in crossbite, and the maxilla is within the margins, way within the margins, of the mandible. And what this pretends for us is that the maxilla is very small. <clears throat> but then taking the CT scan, we see the right side is nice and open. The left side, the sinus is completely cloudy. So there is no way that we're going to be doing implants on this procedure without first having an ENT consultation and treatment.
And this is what was done. Contacted her ENT surgeon. Um, they went ahead, did the surgery in the sinus. We waited for about two months after surgery to see if everything was cleared up. Then the patient returns. On the, this is the pre-op of our CT. They still see here the cloudiness of the sinus, but it's giving us an idea of the length of the implant in the small maxilla. And look at this very, very thin alveolar ridge. Thank goodness that we have a nice area of the zygoma with cancellous compartment with cortical bone in order to stabilize and anchor the implant. So in planning, we thought the best case would be is to give her uh, six implants, pterygoid, zygoma, and anterior implants. So our panographic x-ray before surgery. And on the pre-planning, we're seeing here that the zygoma implants are going to be in that very thin ridge, and the anterior implants are going to be placed initially from the pal palatal region up into the nasalis area. So we have a nice path from the ridge to the zygoma, and look at this concave lateral maxillary wall. This would be like in the Zago definition, probably at type three. Now this is very good for us placing the implant because remember this patient had a chronic sinusitis on the left side. So we want as much as possible to avoid going into the antrum. So the usual dissection that we would do for the zygoma implant, starting from the anterior nasal spine down anteriorly, and then our crestal incision with a vertical relaxing incision. Again, this is the dissector, which I think is invaluable for elevating that flap and making sure the periosteum is on tack, because the point of this is just right down onto bone. As you lift it up with the forceps, then this is going to remove a lot of the bone easily, I mean, a lot of the flap easily as you reflect it. Now we have to be very careful in where we're making our pilot hole for the drill in this lateral wall, because we want to avoid the sinus on the right side as well as on the left side. So the pilot hole is made on the lateral region. We're putting in a first, put in an instrument, a guide to see that in fact we are on bone. And then we'll bring the Norris diamond drill, as we talked about last week, down to the alveolar ridge to make this little C notch on the alveolar ridge where that implant is going to seat. Now, the membrane is just lifted. We're not perforating through the membrane, but you can see the path that was, the, that was uh, positioned with the Norris drill. Here's an intact sinus membrane. We're going through the pilot hole with our spear drill to make sure that we're entering into the zygoma. And then start with sequential drilling. But here, I wanna use the guide with the drill to make sure that I am nowhere near the orbit because remember, this is a very, very small maxilla. So the, imp the uh, drill would be placed into the area of the pilot hole. The guide would be directly positioned over the drill, which will then give us this line of an accurate line of where the drill is going to be, and we're bypassing the orbit. So sequential drilling, here is the orbit, and we see on all sides. This is very in, uh, invaluable, easy technique just to make sure that we're away from the orbit and not causing any damage. Then the uh, guide is placed to measure and place the implant. Shorter implant in this case because the maxilla is so small, but it still contacts into the uh, zygoma. Very important, 
was this C notch that was made with the uh, Norris diamond drill so that this implant seats within that notch in very, very close proximity. Then a uh, multi-unit abutment is placed because the patient is going to leave in the evening, in the afternoon, with a temporary fixed appliance. Now, we're going to put in regular implants in the anterior, starting a little bit more towards on the palatal area. And even now, go ahead and start using this for a pterygoid implant. So we'll do now on the contralateral side and take note of that concavity. So you can, of the lateral wall of the maxilla. So you can see that if we start the drill process here on the ridge, hopefully what we're going to be able to do is completely bypass this into the zygoma without the damaging or going into the antrum. Same thing with our pilot drill on the lateral aspect. This is see the thin wall of the antrum that's over here. Using now the Norris drill to bring it down into about that second bicuspid region. Take away the lateral bone. Using this with the zygo guide to make sure that we're not into the orbit. And now this is a uh, guide, measuring guide into the defect to see one, the direction, how much bone we have on the lateral wall and how long the implant is going to be placed. So in placing the implant, note that we've completely avoided going into the lateral wall of the maxilla. This is really extra maxillary case. Now to make this a better take case for the patient and good retention, we want to make sure obviously that that implant is into that C notch. So it's going to add some other retention. And now we can place the pterygoid implants. Now the pterygoid implant is going to be placed at an angle as we talked about, but your multi-unit abutment is going to bring that back to a plane on the alveolar ridge. Anterior implant is also placed. This is how we wanted the implants to be on the uh, pre-op diagnosis and the planning on the CT scan. And this is what we had post-operatively. Um, this is uh, her piercing that she has on the tongue. So with the multi-unit abutments, the case is ready to be scanned. Using the scan bodies. The case was worked up preliminarily before we did the surgery. Now the prosthesis is being accomplished and the patient ends up with a fixed appliance in the afternoon or in the evening. So we did the started, we just started the surgery about 8.30 and the case was ready to be delivered somewhere around four o'clock in the afternoon. Very happy patient. Went from a full denture appliance that was not acceptable to a fixed case. So I want to share with you before we end the uh, webinar today, using the EasyGoma guided surgery for zygoma and pterygoid implants. So this was using the guide to place their zygoma and pterygoid. And what we needed to do, obviously, well, here, let's look at this picture. She's 37 years old, an attractive woman, a failing maxillary teeth, has partial denture prosthesis. And these are maxillary teeth are failing. There is the mandible and the maxilla. Now there is somewhat of a, a hyperplastic area of the alveolar bones. We're having a large amount of alveolar bone. What's interesting about this case is using the uh, EasyGoma guide, it will show us how much bone we have to remove on the alveolus in order to place the implants. So preoperative panorex and surgical procedure will be to remove the failing teeth. Now 
lifting a mucoperiosteal flap, cleaning out the debriding area of all granulation tissue in the sockets. And making sure we have good flap, incision and flap design. So we're going to have to do, we're using the guide, but we're going to have to take away a lot of this alveolar bone, some alveolar bone in order for the guide to fit and also to have the prosthesis fit well into the mandible with the occlusion. So what they gave us was this guide prior to doing any surgery to place the implants. So at the same day, we've elevated the flap, tied the palatal region with the suture and place this soft tissue guide, the hard tissue guide, I'm sorry, onto the ridge, making sure now this is stable with screws so it does not move. And this now is the distance that we're going to have to remove from the alveolus in order to place the zygoma implants. So an alveoplasty is accomplished, dictated by the design of this guide. So the alveoplasty is all finished. It's retentive with these screws. We're gonna take those screws out. And now what we see is the alveolus. So this is the easy goma guide. Place it onto the right side, make sure it sits perfectly well and firm. And then this is now stabilized with screws while we're holding this tight onto the bone to make sure this is completely stable. The guide is now stable and we can start through the opening of where we're gonna place the first implant with our a round bird just to give us a path of placing the implant. The Norris drill goes into the same area, pushing it back, taking away enough bone on the crest of the ridge, and then sequential drilling directly through the guide. Cleaning out, make sure this is not well irrigated, and now place the implant, again with your finger on the lateral portion to make sure you're all right. And this is now screwed, the implant is now tightened with the screwdriver, with the driver into the bone. A multi-unit abutment is attached and we can proceed with the other implant. So the first implant is here. The second implant on the guide is gonna be in this position, do the same drilling procedure as we did with the first implant. The implant now is down through the guide. And the next thing to do would be then to put the tevergoid implant. Sequential drilling as we described for the pterygoid. Now we're gonna put on uh, multi-unit abutments, make sure they're lined up on the alveolar ridge. and place the implant. The implant is placed under the guide guidance of the guide. Now on the contralateral side did the same thing. So just to make sure we're positioning the guide on our stereolithic model that we took from the CT scan. Now the uh, EasyGoma guide is placed on the ridge, stabilized with screws and the same sequence of drilling procedure as we did on the contralateral side. Sequential drilling, placing the implant, making sure that finger is parts of the implant so it's really close, tight to the alveolar ridge. And even through the guide, we have now the multi-unit abutment that can be placed. Sequential drilling, the implant is placed and it's exactly positioned where we had determined from the easy, easy Goma guide. Multi-unit abutments, and now we're ready for the 
uh, pterygoid. Pterygoid is now through the guide, sequential drilling, lots of water irrigation, and you can place the implant exactly through the guide and it'll torque down where we want it on the crest of the ridge. So after surgery, we looked at the implant, we looked at the guides. Here we see the zygo uh, pterygoid, two zygomas, two zygomas and a pterygoid, each with multi-unit abutments. In the afternoon, patient was able to leave after the prosthetic reconstruction with a fixed case, temporary with PMMA uh, while the healing process is going on. But she comes in with a failing maxillary dentition and leaves with a fixed dentition. Well, we've had a couple seminars together. Thank you for attending. But if you want to learn zygoma and pterygoid implants, there's a few ways you have to do this. Uh, you can take a cadaver course, which I showed you last year or last week, and it does give us practice on cadavers with atrophic maxillas in order to practice our surgical procedure procedures and then do the dissection to see exactly what we were doing from a anatomic standpoint. So this is one of the many cadavers that we had ready for our class. It's a good facility. But the piece de resistance, the best thing that you can do in order to feel confident and learn this is that you have to do this with, in my opinion, live surgery. You're not gonna be able to learn this surgery or feel confident with this surgery with doing over the shoulder viewing. This is a active procedure. This is not a point where you're, you're just looking at it. This is an active course where you need to get in here um, to do the surgery. Uh, in the Zygoma course we do in Brazil, it's a very experienced faculty. We have a day of lecturing and then three days where you absolutely you know, do surgery. And the surgical procedures that are done are mostly diagnosed from panographic x-rays because as I talked about last week, the placing zygomas and pterygoids are an anatomic situation. We want to look at what the anatomy is and that depends on how we're doing the flaps. And with the incisions and the flap design that we've discussed, you'll be able to see the anatomy. Our staff, Dr. Rosen, myself, Dr. Salvoni, excellent. And all these cases are done with IV sedation or anesthesia. So I wanna thank you again for visiting me, letting us, let me visit you, I guess, into the course. And I'll stand by if there are any questions. If you have some other questions not on the, on the situation today that you wanna post, then just send me an email at smiler at smiler.net and I'll certainly answer any of the questions for this. So now, uh, thank you very much for attending and I think we have a couple questions. Uh, Dr. Valerio from Italy, very nice, thank you for attending. In the previous webinar, Dr. Petrogano engaged the infratemporal fossa. What is your opinion? Well, there's a difference. I know Paul. Paul, he's a very, very, very fine surgeon. And I've known, known Dr. Petrogano for God, way over 30 years. If he's engaging the bone at that infratemporal fossa, what he's really, I'm sure, doing is the lateral wall of the maxilla and taking the uh, the tissue, that tissue in the infratemporal fossa, and placing it a little bit more, positioning it more into the fossa region so you don't damage it. Um, I've not had the experience of going through the infratemporal fossa to place the implants. And uh, in our situation, I haven't seen that necessary yet. Uh, can you show us how to check in this CBT, the pterygoid implant placement? Um, yes, I can. Please send me the email and then I will share with you my workup on the CT scan and we can look at this on the screen together. But yes, I'm very happy to do that. 
uh, are there 3D printed demo models of the skull available online for practice? Um, you know, that's an interesting question because of the number of cases that Dr. Rosen and I have done with a CT scan, we've always made a stereolithic model. So what we've done on all our cases is that we do the CT scan, then make a stereolithic model before we do surgery. But I suppose if you wanted to see various uh, cases, various areas of anatomy, we could make available the models that we've used before, just reprint them, and they could be used to help you. Is immediate provisional prosthesis mandatory for zygoma implants? Um, no, it's not. Um, the idea about doing immediate provisional zygoma implants is really driven in our Los Angeles Beverly Hills practice by the patient that will not accept having a uh, temporary appliance or going without their teeth. So the, in my opinion, in our opinion, the best thing to do would be to place the implants, put on the uh, healing caps, suture it, bring the patient back in about uh, three, four weeks, and then put on the multi-unit abutments. When I suture these cases, if we're going to be doing the prosthesis later, I'll take as some of your, your older doctors who were visiting on the webinar, remember silver nitrate sticks. Uh, you can wet them, and these silver nitrate sticks tattoo the tissue. So right over where the implants are, you add a little bit of tattoo before closing. The reason for that is now when you go back to identify the implant, you have the exact location for putting in your uh, instrument in order to take away the tissue and then place it. Um, the other part of the question is by anchorage only in the zygoma and if the crestal anchorage is absent. Crestal, yes, crestal anchorage for stabilizing the implant is absent. All of the anchorage is coming from the zygoma. You want it in contact with the alveolar ridge so that it's on bone to help you with the prosthetics. And you, if, and you want some points so that from a mechanical standpoint, that implant is not moving. So if you have a stable part on the crest and then a stable part into the zygoma, that's the best case. Easy guide is great, obviously customized. Cost and turnaround time. Uh, you'll have to check with uh, Norris about that, but let me make one note and I forgot to mention this. If you're going to use the easy guide, get under your belt oh, many cases of doing this freehand. You want to be able to have at your, uh, your uh, fingertips the ability that if there's anything wrong with the guide, you can go back to how you learned the anatomy of the procedure as we did in the last lecture. So the easy guide, you know, is something nice to see, but I think it's, uh, or to use. Um, in most cases, we can do this without the guide cost and turnaround time, you really have to talk to Norris about that. Please repeat the pterygoid drilling sequence. Um, I will, yes, thank you, uh, Asad, for your, your uh, question. Please give me um, or send me an email with your email address. And what I will do actually for anyone is that I can go over the sequence with you and even show you some of the uh, slides or some of the CT scans where we're working. Ah, uh, Dr. Liss, thank you for your comment. Nice, it's nice to see you here. Uh, very interesting presentation. The last case would have been possible. Let's see, wait a minute. To make just an all on four um, in that first molar region. Well, the question has always arrived when we were discussing the case, that last case, is the quality of the, of the bone and how long we net the implants if we're gonna use any type conventional implants in the case for healing. But she wanted to have a fixed case immediately with this, with good stability. And uh, we thought that the only way to do this was to get good anchorage into the zygoma. Placing the buccal fat pad over the zygoma implant, what's your position? I think it's a great idea. 
you can make a small incision, pull the buccal fat, fat down, and place it over the implant. The zygoma guide used was universal guide or fabricated for, no, the guide, the zygoma guide is part of the Norris kit we have. Um, Michael, nice to see you again too. Please write your email address on the screen. I don't know how I do that, but it's very simple. Smiler, S-M-I-L-E-R, at smiler.net. And I'll be very happy to share any of the information that we have. Um, can you provide information or the link for the future live cases in Brazil? Yes. Um, I don't know if the, if the uh, slides are still up. But again, send me uh, your email address. I'll give you the link that we use for Dr. Rosa and I when we're planning the cases in Brazil. Um, the flyer and all the information. Well, thank you everyone. It's been a pleasure sharing some information with you. And uh, if there are no more questions, I think we'll stop the procedure.